someone say this a while ago, and it's a quote that has stuck with me for so long. Because when you think about how you live your life, many of us are not living in the right now. Most of us are either living in the past of things that happened or we're living hopeful for the future about things that hadn't happened yet. And though past, present, and future all play dynamic roles in our lives, it's really important to honor where you are right now in this moment today. I want you to release your past. I want you to set it free. I want you to even relish in the beauty of your past if it's brought you incredible joy in your life, great experience, great accomplishments and accolades. But we have to move on from it. We have to move on from it because when I am talking to new entrepreneurs and I am coaching people and I am challenging them to do better than they did the day before, the common question that I get is, well, yesterday I did my very best. So how am I going to do better than my very best? And I had this conversation on uh, Instagram. I went live with this conversation and the conversation was so impactful for so many people that I believe that you need it to, because you may not have seen that and you need it to. And so what I'm going to talk to you about right now is your best and why your best is keeping you from your greatest your best is keeping you from becoming your greatest self and achieving the greatest thing that is waiting for you. Because if I'm being totally transparent, your best is just not good enough. Your best is just not good enough. Most of us started a job somewhere, whether you were cutting grass or you had an actual W-2 job, right? And that's where we all start. And honestly, we want to respect that part of the process because your job will teach you certain principles and values and operations and processes that help you to become a good entrepreneur. Here's the thing. It is easier to be a good entrepreneur when you were a good employee. That's a fact. It's not required that you be a good employee to be a good entrepreneur, but it is easier to be a good entrepreneur if you were first a good employee. If you were a person who lacked work ethic and your employer couldn't trust you to show up on time, to be working while you were on the clock, to do the job and get the result, why would your client trust you to show up on time, to do the work on time, and to deliver the result? Guys, the energy that you put out will always reciprocate. Even if you feel like you got lucky and you hit the jackpot and you sucked as an employee and you're making it as an entrepreneur, it's going to come back and pay you somehow. Might not be through your performance, but it might be when you're ready to start hiring people, then you get terrible employees because of the type of employee you were, right? Or you don't know how to be an effective leader because you didn't know how to be a great follower. So if you are working... We said this once before, change the thought process, right? If you're working and you want to work your way off of the job, immediately stop saying that you hate your job. Mm -hmm. Immediately. Because as David said once, the money that you make on your job is the investment capital that you need to create your business. Why wouldn't you respect that? Wouldn't you respect an investor? When you get an investor in your business, are you going to do everything you can to please said investor? Let me make sure we got the reports right. Let me make sure I'm executing. Let me make sure your job is your first investment into your business. I have so much. I just searched myself on YouTube and I have so much content out here that other people have created of me. And one thing that this says is, so I don't build my own YouTube channel, right? But I'm looking at all these people who are just out here getting views off of something that I have executed on. Let me see. And this is another. Um, oh, I just refreshed it. It just changed to something else. Um, this is this is a note to say. Maximize on your own gifts and talents. Mm -hmm. Maximize on your own skill set. When you are out here doing you things. You look crazy in this video. That is... Um, Look at you. Where are you getting glasses from? Look at them. Look at that. I was cute in that video. Okay? Was she? I was cute. He's talking about really? the glasses on. <laughs> he thought you laughed like that. Like, that was really weird. <laughs> you look crazy. My that looked amazing. Um, no, maximize on your own gifts and talents because 
somebody else will. Somebody yeah, else sure. will have to. Like you will have to allow somebody else to maximize your gifts and talents if you if you don't yourself. And what do I mean by that? I mean, like, even from an employment perspective, there's so many people who are so talented and gifted at doing a thing, right? But because you aren't cashing in on your own gifts and talents, your employer currently is. Mm -hmm. I am not building my own personal YouTube channel, which is about to change immediately as I'm scrolling in and I see, oh, David's refreshed again. I see these people who have videos and clips up of me that I don't have on my own YouTube channel. And they're probably monetizing mm -hmm. this and all kinds of stuff. Focus on and hone in on your skills and your talents. You're not in control of anything, baby, <laughs> as an entrepreneur. You are not in control of anything. Do you know why? Because as an entrepreneur, you are governed by your clients and your customers, okay? So you think that you can wake up when you want and go to bed when you want. You think you can show up when you want, but your customers are going to tell you differently. There will be customer service emails. There's going to be somebody who's completely not satisfied with what you've done. There's going to be somebody who wants you to treat their emergency like your own emergency. You don't have the control that you think you have. All right. So I just want to put that out there on in corporate America. You see your boss, you see your employer as the person who is in control of you. They tell you when to go to lunch. They tell you when to clock in. They tell you when to clock out. They tell you when you qualify for vacation time. Well, the beat of your business will tell you the same thing. There are going to be some days that you can't go to lunch when you want to go to lunch. There's going to be some days that you have to cancel, cancel lunch date with your friends. There's going to be some times that you want to travel, but work is requiring too much effort from you and you just can't. You don't have as much control as you want. You go from being governed and monitored by your boss to being bossed by your customers and your clients, okay? And a great entrepreneur understands that. An entrepreneur who is committed to giving value, providing value, and not just offering a product and throwing it out there and never hearing uh, feedback and implementing or executing anything different because of feedback, you understand that you are not as in control as you think you are. Number two, that you are going to become an entrepreneur and have all this free time. That is, <laughs> that is far from true. When you become an entrepreneur, you have less time, honestly, than you do as an employee. When I was working a full-time job, and it's been many years since I've done so, the standard work schedule for me was 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and sometimes when we were in the middle of deadlines or audits and things like that, I had to do a little overtime. And that overtime would look like an extra hour, maybe an extra two. As an entrepreneur, when you are in your process of creating your business, of perfecting your business, of uh, pivoting in your business, you will find yourself working 12-hour days, 15-hour days, 18-hour days. You will turn around, and at the end of the day, you will have forgotten to eat. You will look and say, wait a minute, did I eat breakfast? Did I have time to go to the gym? Did I even shower today? You will be so focused. Why? Because you have to be. Why? Because the success of this business completely depends on you. So if you are someone who's looking to become an entrepreneur because you you want all this free time that it looks like we have based on what we're showing you on the internet, don't do it. Stay employed because as long as, at least as long as you're employed, you have a set schedule. There are some days in my business where I work two hours, four hours. There's some days where it requires 16 hours of me. There are times when I am creating new offers, new programs, working with the tech team. Uh, there are contractors that we utilize in other countries and you have to wake up, like literally setting an alarm to wake up to talk to somebody over in the Philippines or over in India or over in Nigeria that's doing some work with you and they don't operate on the United States time zone. So what do you do in that instance? You set an alarm and you're prepared to wake up and sometimes Sometimes you're on a phone call with people from other countries for hours at a time until the job gets done correctly. So don't mistake for one minute that you get a whole lot of extra free time just because you are now employing yourself. So I became full time as an entrepreneur. I've, I've been. I have been trying my hand at different ventures since I was 17 years old. 
But when I had my first real success and became full-time as an entrepreneur, it was in 2014. And I remember um, at that time, I was just really rebuilding as a result of like going through the the 2008 to 2010 economic crash, right? So at this time, I'm- You went through that. Absolutely. I went through that. Like I lost everything. Lost my house, lost my car. Oh, you was in like the real estate. I was in real estate and I lost everything, right? And so my mom was gracious enough to allow me to live with her. Well, my mom still lived in her ch- in my childhood home. And at this time, uh, you know, it's 2010 beyond. Uh, the house was built in, say, 1987. So now the house needs like some plumbing and it needs a new roof and some things could happen down in the basement. And every single time I turned into the neighborhood, I saw a decent neighborhood of now older established homes and I would ride through and I would see people and wave at my neighbors when I turn in the neighborhood and it's my neighbors, you know, those neighbors who they're just getting by, but they happy with their little corner in the world, right? (laughs) You see them out there proud to be cutting their grass and you see them out there proud to be uh, planting their rose bushes. And I would just always say, that's not what I want. You see them having to move out because everybody's foreclosing on their homes. And I'm seeing these people who have been in their homes for 20 plus years. Now this economy has forced them to have to make other plans. And I'm driving through the house. All of them are starting to look old. All the paint on the outside is starting to look like it needs a new a new paint job. And it's it, it just was not inspiring. Get into my house and me and my mom, I mean, me and my daughter are sharing my old high school bedroom or childhood bedroom. It's not an environment that I want to be in, nor was it an environment that I wanted for her. You can't have sleepovers because you and your mom sleep in the same bed. Is that humbling? How did you feel about that? It was heartbreaking. It was beyond humbling, right? At least when you're humble, you still have some pride. But at that time, I, I didn't have any pride. How do you explain to your daughter that she can't do what the other kids are doing because you made bad choices? You made the decision to be irresponsible. Mm. You made the decision to not educate yourself about money. You knew you had to do it, but you just didn't do it. Right. So I had to tell her all those times, you know, how do you how do you lay in the bed with your daughter who's starting to grow a body and she she doesn't have the space to, like, explore herself and things like that. So I became I'm sorry, real quick, because I I can imagine I remember there were certain reasons I couldn't get stuff growing up because I didn't do well in school or I had bad grades. But imagine your child doing everything that they're supposed to do. They're getting they good can. grades in school and they still can't. They still can't, right? And mm. I got tired, David, of having to make up games for her to understand. Like, oh, we're going to play this game and we're going to do this. And I got tired of having to sell her on the idea that we're so close. We do everything together. She loves me. You know, I got this is this is how it was. This is because there was no other choice. And even when this was happening around 2013, now fast forward 2013, I'm back making six figures again, but I was still attached to that trauma of having lost everything. So I was not yet on my own. I was scared to go out and get another place. I found comfort in my mom's house. We could afford this small mortgage. Like we could afford this lifestyle. And I had to tell myself, I I had to get to the point where I became sick and tired. And honestly, I think my daughter is what really was the catalyst for it because I would have, I would have negotiated my environment on my own behalf much differently than I do for my daughter. And so what ended up happening was I started to manage this property. I started to manage this high rise apartment community in Atlanta. And the people who would come in there, I'd already been in property management for years. So now it's 2012, 2013. And the people who would come in there were getting these apartments that leased for like $4,000 a month. And they would come in and I would wonder like, what do you do? How can you afford to live here? Like, can you just tell me more? I take them on tours. Like, well, how did you get started in that? What are you doing? Like, how do, well, what do I need to qualify for that? And so many people were coming in who were doing things that I wanted to do that it made me feel like I am not activating my dream, but every single day I come into work to serve people who I could never afford to live like. Mm. 
Mm. And that became an issue for me. These people were living out what I actually wanted to do. They were entrepreneurs and high level executives. And, you know, I'm, I'm coming into work and I just it, I just could not do it anymore. I was taking orders from someone who could care less, like my boss could care less about what I had going on. And so now at this point, I'm in MLM in the company that you and I met in and I'm doing very well between my job and it. And it got to the point where my boss had one more time to piss me off. <laughs> We've all been there, right? One more time. And I was, I literally said, if they do this one more time, I am going to quit. They did it one more time. But before I quit, I started a business. I started a property management company leveraging my job to build my company, right? Now, I'm still living at home in my mom's house in, you know, College Park, Georgia, where I had grown up, but things have now changed in College Park, Georgia, the area that I lived in. And I decided that what the final straw for me and what changed was I wanted to live in the building that I managed. And we had an employee program. Long story short, my boss denied me for the unit. He did not hold me to the same criteria that the Caucasian women were able, the people who reported to me were able to get units in the building, two of them. But then the criteria changed when it was my turn to get units in the building. So I said, you know what? I make enough money. I am going to walk away from this. So that building that I once managed and was treated poorly in, I quit my job and I moved into the building Mm. on my own. And I turned around and it became a goal of mine to make the people who mistreated me now have to serve me. (laughs) And people questioned it. Why would you want to live in a building where people mistreated you? These were employees. They were employees. You don't benefit off of me living in this building. The management company didn't mistreat me. These two people mistreated me. So now every single day, I am going to remind you of how to treat the people who are going to come and replace me because when I need my dry cleaning dropped off. Mm. (laughs) When I need my groceries delivered. I'm sorry. (laughs) Do I have a package downstairs? Can someone please bring it up? (laughs) So one of the struggles that I have quite like Reese is what's really going to be the difference? Like during the pandemic, They printed trillions of dollars. But more people were laid off in our lifetime than ever before. They did print all this money, but are they not going to do the same thing? No, they they can't. They can't pop. You know, and I'm saying it (laughs) like with absolute certainty. Yeah, like I'm an analyst. But it doesn't seem like it seems like they shouldn't have done that the first time because now it weakens the dot. Like if there's more money in circulation, of course everything goes up. And now that everything goes up, things don't... It's not like bread goes up and then bread goes down. It seems like when bread goes up, it goes up. When milk goes up... It this stays is the there. Yeah. This is milk. But now there's not as much money being printed. Mm-hmm. So the people who are, who are, you know, in that situation before, now they just have to pay more for the things that they, know, they need. So I think, especially for entrepreneurs, this is probably going to be a season where we have to really... We have to enter a season of collaboration, right? Like, how can we support each other through the economy? And just, you know, for for people who are who are not entrepreneurs or people who don't have consistent incomes yet uh, as an entrepreneur, this is your time to really, really, really analyze where you are in your life right now. Like what expenses can you cut back on? Like, don't wait for the recession to come. By the time it hits, by the time it gets here, typically it's too late. So we have everybody saying that the recession is coming. It's on its way. We can start doing some things right now. Listen, I have a standing All week. I have right now I have a standing hair appointment every single week. Maybe I need to get back and go to the beauty supply store and stock up on some shampoo and conditioner. Like or these hats. are or hats. Like may, these are things that we have to start doing right now where can but i I think that the i think the person who's going to be the most set apart though to surviving this pandemic is the person who seeks information 
to f- pandemic recession. Oh, did I say pandemic mm-hmm. recession? Is the person who starts to seek information now to figure out how you can make money on your own? Because whether they're printing more money or not, people still have money. Mm-hmm. People still have money. The economy is still going to move and people still have money to invest in spending themselves. How do you enter an industry that's a need, that's needed? Meaning still pay us for coaching, okay? Yeah, still, <laughs> still, still, still get your coaching and your education, like if this is a need for you. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, if you're only selling, you know, things that, I don't know, something, if you're only selling these things as an entrepreneur, this might not get you through the pandemic or through the recession because this is not attached to a need. Mm. What can you do instead that absolutely is attached to a need? So yep. during the recession times, I know a lot of people are affected uh, with their mental health. So are you someone right now who maybe you're working a job and one of your strong suits is helping people out with their mental health? This might be your time to shine. <sighs> As an entrepreneur, people suffer from like weight weight loss, weight gain, whatever the case may be. This might be your time to shine. Depression, this might be your time to shine. Uh, Accountability, this might be your time to shine. Like start thinking in those directions and figure something out. Most people who are successful at a thing, you're you're successful at it because you're skilled at that one thing. Mm -hmm. And then I know just speaking from my own experience, the stress factors really come in when you're focused on trying to do the parts that you're not good at, Mm -hmm. right? especially when you're in the beginning and you don't have the money maybe to invest in the people who are good at the vision or the systems or the technical stuff, whatever it is. And you're that one person show and you're having to think about it, right? Like you design dresses, you sew them, you put them together, but how they're going to get on the models. I don't want to think about that, right? How I'm going to get all of this press. I don't want to think about that. So we have to, and this is really why building community is so important because you have all these crazy entrepreneurs in one environment and outside of this environment, people think that your dreams are crazy or they're too big or you'll never get stuff done. You meet, you match with the right person who is the right talent. And then you're the right technical person or you're the right marketer or you're the right operation. Magic begins to happen. Mm -hmm. I never knocked anybody's teeth out. You but I was never afraid you to fight. You ever tried? All right, okay. No, because teeth will bust your nose. <laughs> I was never afraid. I was never afraid to fight, right? And I was never afraid to assert myself into a situation. Like I was the person who would protect my friends. I'm coming. If I'm coming through, every leave it alone because Donnie gonna do something real ignorant, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it was cute back then to be that person right. because nobody expected it from me. As I began to grow into different environments, you would see how unattractive it was to be the woman who's always on go. Always on go. I'm going to tell that MF her off and yada, yada, yada. Nobody wants to be around that person. And so I had to make the decision to grow. Right. But in full transparency, growth doesn't mean perfect. Mm-hmm. Because I almost yanked somebody across the counter on our way here to Houston. (laughs) He had to literally drag me off away from this woman. Growth doesn't mean perfect, right? What you need to do, and as I'm thinking about myself, like, it was really embarrassing in hindsight looking at it because I really almost did yank this one. I I was trying to yank this woman across the counter in the airport. Like, that's probably fed time. Okay, what happened though? I'd like to know. (laughs) I like to know what, what, what happened. What's the scenario? So we're running to the plane, and I already got an attitude because I'm hangry, like dumb hungry, right? So we're looking at these two options of food. So I go to the one place, and I'm like, "Hey," and I ask her, "Hey, about how long does it take to get food from this restaurant?" She tells me, "Ma'am, go down there, and I'm gonna help you when I finish doing what I'm doing." Mm. <laughs> I wish I was there. Oh, <laughs> now, I look at this restaurant and I look at the other option. The other option only had French fries as a choice. 
So am I going to get on this flight? I got to be on the plane literally in like six minutes. Am I going to go with these French fries or am I just going to suck it on up and go on down there and wait for this lady to come serve me? So I go down there and she's fixing my plate. And this is all happening so fast. She's fixing my plate. I asked for chicken fingers. And then I somebody else brought out some rotisserie chicken. So I said, ooh, while she's putting it on my tray, I said, ooh, is that white meat or dark meat? She said, do you see both? Yo. It's like a movie. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so, so I got one earring off at this point. Like, okay, she, she trying me. Like, I'm starting to sweat under my underarms, and I don't sweat like that, right? So it's, it's escalating into a situation. So I said, yeah, I see both, ma'am. I'm sorry. Can I have the rotisserie chicken instead of the chicken fingers? She says, once it's on your tray, I can't put it back. Now, she is behind the glass holding my plate. She is not giving me the plate. She's put a chicken finger on the plate. The woman came and brought her the pan of rotisserie chicken. With that same hand, she put the rotisserie chicken on the line. So I said, I'm sorry. The same hand that just put the rotisserie chicken up can't take my fried chicken tender out and swap it for a rotisserie chicken? Ma'am, you want this food or not? Hold up, hold up. <laughs> Because now, right? So I'm still starving. And I said, ma'am, I'm just trying to make an order. That's all. I just want to get food. So we're walking to the register. And she's like, I understand you in a rush, but your emergency is not my emergency. Mm, that's a bar, though. It is a bar. It's a and you bar. Gotta, you got to agree. It's a it's bar. A bar. It's a, <laughs> she, said, she says, I understand you're in a rush, but your emergency is not my emergency. I said, no. But preparing my order is your, um, is your responsibility, right? And she said, your emergency is not our responsibility. I said, no, but preparing my order is, okay? And I can't believe that the same hand that put that rotisserie chicken out can't swap my fried chicken for a piece of rotisserie chicken. So she throws my plate across the, the and it bumps into me right here. And I'm, at this point, I'm about to lose my mind. Like, everybody can get it at this point. So I pushed the plate back and was like, hold up, I don't know what you think this is, but it ain't that. Okay? Mm. It's about to get real ignorant real fast. Ma'am, so she walks away. He comes walking up. And she's like, it's about to be a good day. That's the only thing Ooh. you going to do to me to take it. I said, you got damn right. It's about to be a good day. <laughs> And he's like, Donnie, what is going on? I'm like, what's going on? So he's literally like pulling me off. She's talking, I'm talking. And I'm like, I will yank you across this encounter so fast. And he's like, come on, I turn back around. He's pulling me away. And so I literally, my whole walk, she allowed me to go so far back. Like, I'm like, you oh, and did and did and did and did so I dare you. Dad, dare you. <laughs> Anyway. So, <laughs> Yo, but you had food on the plane, though. That was the food. That was the food. I took my... So so I go to pay for the food. I'm paying... Can, he's like... Same just, lady or... Same lady. He's like, just pay for the food. So I pay for the food. I put my phone... She, she Put your card in. So I put my card in. Nothing happens. It says, take my card out. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't confirm a price. I said, ma'am, did my transaction go through or not? Did it? What do you see? This is crazy. Heffa, did this go transaction go through <laughs> or not? Okay? Because at this point, like, for real. And this is all happening in a matter of, like, three minutes. And so she's like, do you need a receipt? I was like, yes, I need a receipt. So she just keep popping off. I said, you know what? It's your receipt. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens is now we make it to the plane. I don't know if you and Dre noticed. That I wasn't in the mood it to talk. It was an energy. It was, an it was energy. definitely an energy, right? He embarrassed. I'm riled up. And and we were about to miss the flight. The the late the gate agent said that was about to be one expensive meal. Mm -hmm. We flying first class, right? I said, I wish I would have missed this flight because I would have went back and whipped up. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I get from the story, Ooh, though? Oh, wait. Okay. So now we're sitting in first class. And all I can talk about is what happened. That had me up and da 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 And the people around me are like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so where that could have been a networking opportunity and you're sitting in first class, you could have talked to people. And it just so happened that the woman 
the two people who were sitting behind us checked into our hotel. Mm. What did I blow? A young black woman and maybe her daughter or somebody else who is obviously a professional woman. And this is a woman who's paying anywhere from $600 to $900 a night to stay at this hotel. She's staying for six nights. So your girl got a little bread. I could have turned around and said, oh my God, we were just on the same plane together. Let's connect if you got time for a drink. But because I was so consumed in this ignorance, now I'm embarrassed, like, have a good stay. (laughs) (laughs) How many opportunities have you blown just being who you are? And this is for everybody. Check this, check this though. Here's here's what, uh, and sometimes we may not connect it, but I think it all rooted from the pattern of being late. Oh, it did. In the event that you had a little more time, you'd be like, oh, we'll just take this one and we'll sit there and we'll chill and... Can I say something? Please. Because... You're trying to take my bar? Are you doing? Like, I just had a point. So I was ready <laughs> because I knew I was... Where are you going? I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> that story got her on fire. All right. <laughs> Where do you think you going? <laughs> I was I was so ready. I was on time. I had my bags packed. He comes. He's late. He lollygagging at the barbershop. <laughs> right? <laughs> he's lollygagging at the barbershop. I needed to go get a Fenty Beauty eyebrow pencil. And so now I'm livid because I'm like, yo, I don't have time to stop at Sephora and get me some food. I didn't even want to eat in the airport, okay? I wanted to go to another restaurant and grab me some food. So I'm proud of myself. David and them going to be proud. Like, we're on time. (laughs) I I wanted to beat him to the gate personally, right? I wanted to beat him to the gate. He says, oh, we got enough time. We're going to go to Sephora. And I said, we don't have time to go to Sephora. We're going to be late. I'm not trying to be running through the airport. Like, we got just enough time <laughs> at this point to get there, park comfortably, and walk through the airport. We, 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 we can go. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. <laughs> I still feel like... It wasn't me being late, though. However, you could have went to Sephora the day before. You knew you needed it. Couldn't. Why can't, why can't you? Because I was super busy. And he's about to bring up a text <laughs> where I said... <laughs> Hello? Is this, is this on? It's on? Can y'all hear me? I don't need you to go to Sephora for me because I asked to go to Sephora on her behalf yes. at before the airport. Right. I don't need you to go to Sephora with me. I'd rather you just come back here to do to go out and get other stuff on that way. So she told me, I don't need you to go to Sephora. Because he had taken so long at the barbershop. And to be clear, to be clear, hold on, let me ask you, let me ask you, let me ask you. Up front, I'll go on your behalf. Let me ask you, are you typically late places? Never. Never. Never? I'm sorry I'm being involved. When we double date though. (laughs) I'm holding you accountable. When we double date though, when we double date, both of y'all are always late. I was okay. late because of her. Okay. All right, so here's the okay. thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm always late. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, so. <laughs> Yo, you for sure. <laughs> Yo, so Joe told me. And y'all, y'all be wondering why I say I'm single until I'm married, okay? <laughs> I love, I love him. All right, so so check this out. Here's here's so all right. So I'm about I'm about to I'm about we to. We are not you. drilling down on this. This is so, how okay. we get to the money. We got notes. We got right. notes. We do got notes. However, got notes. moral of the story: there is some pattern that you have that's affecting so many different areas of your life, and no. you've had it for. You can sit down. Man. I'm sorry. It's you've a had, You've had it for so long that you don't even realize that it has tentacles. Yeah. Because I'm constantly late, this one time that I was ready like an hour and a half early, he assumed I got time because she always late. Mm -hmm. Usually when we're trying to be or when we need to be consistent at something, it's because we want a result that's different than a result that we've already got. Mm -hmm. So we had to be tired of not ranking on the podcast charts. So what do we do? 
we become more and more and more consistent, put out really dope content, and now we're ranked on the podcast charts. And now we don't want to be ranked where we are on the podcast right. charts. We want to rank a little higher. So you're you're more and more and more. Same thing like with weight or with building a business. You have to decide. You have to get mad, right? Mm. You, you got to get really mad. I used to do this training called MAD, and it's make a decision. And it's around MAD saying is an acronym for make a decision. Like people get mad just to focus on a point that leaves you staying the same or worse when really the better way to channel that anger is to get mad enough to make a decision, a decision that's going to change a thing about you. And the proof of the, the truth of the matter is there is nothing that you can accomplish great without consistency. Nope. The truth of the matter is the only thing that you can truly accomplish with the lack of consistency is staying the same. So you have to ask yourself and make a decision that I am so fed up with the results that I'm getting right now, or I'm so unsatisfied with where I am right now, that consistency is the only decision that I am going to commit to right now in order to start to see things change. I said earlier that a lot of times when we're trying to identify what part of our environment is causing us to stay in this place that we don't want to be in, that is that is us. A lot of that reason is us. It's because before you start cutting off friends and moving out of neighborhoods and going into other environments, you have to retrain your brain. You have to start feeding your brain and your body better information, better thoughts. It's auto-suggestion. It's self-auto-suggestion, right? So when I start my day, which I do start my day every single day with meditation and affirmations, like it's really difficult to get out of the bed and be angry. How many people ever woke up just out of the bed? You mad already? <laughs> you just get up out of the bed and you're lying because only two people raised their hand, right? <laughs> Y'all are not telling the truth. Y'all have never gone somewhere and you're short with somebody or you've kind of gone off on somebody. You're like, Ugh, I'm just not feeling it today. Today is just not my day. How is it seven o'clock in the morning and you mad already? <laughs> you're mad already. Your alarm went off at six. By seven, you're mad already. And you're blaming it on things like I haven't had my coffee or you're still mad about the argument that you had last night. You have to train your brain. When you start focusing intentionally on personal development, things like missing your cup of coffee at the regular time and it delaying itself an hour won't bother you as much. That argument from last night, you won't even really remember the point that took you to the next level of passivity because you are so in tune with personal development and you know that personal development will help you shake something off very, very quickly. If you are not reading a book, listen to a book. If you're not listening to the book, watch the documentary. Stay tuned into the to, to the Social Proof Podcast because this is, uh, in, in our day and age, this is a huge personal development Absolutely. resource. A huge, all we talk about on this podcast is success. But let me tell you something. The success typically doesn't come until you make room for it. Mm, so, okay, explain that. Explain that. Explain that. Explain that. So it's about environment, right? The, a successful environment. I'm not talking about physical environment, but the environment for success. Have you created the environment for success? Number one, so many of us want to make it out of the hood or make it out of our current situations that... We haven't even we haven't decided what we want to do. How are we going to do it? Okay, I want to get out of the hood, but how am I going to do it? I want to change my life, but what vehicle am I going to use to do it? Right. So that's vision. Do you have a vision? Have you established a vision? You want to make it out of the hood, but what exactly does that look like? Does that mean make it to the neighborhood next door to the hood? Does that mean make it to the other side of town? Are your neighbors now uh, multicultural? Are you in an upper class African-American neighborhood? What exactly does that look like? Right. I knew that when I moved to a different environment, it was important for me to be in a mixed cultural environment because I have now worked with all kinds of people and I wanted my daughter who was in a predominantly black neighborhood all her life. I wanted her to understand how to work with other people. 
and navigate those kind of relationships and friendships. So what's the vision that you have? And what does it look like? When you close your eyes, what do you see yourself driving? Maybe that's not even important to you. Maybe what you drive isn't important. The other thing that was important to me, Shans, when I moved from the South Side was having access to quality food. Mm. <laughs> having access to quality food was hugely important to me because every time I got off my exit, there was a Popeye's and a Chick-fil-A and a Wendy's, but there was no uh, fresh market. Is that when you develop your taste for churches? <laughs> She loves churches. It's crazy. She's the bougiest person, but loves churches. For the record, I do not eat churches chicken, but I do have a craving. Let me just environment, okay? Environment. Clear it up. Clear it up. Because whenever I go to the E complex, my choice is churches chicken or something else full of you know salt and sodium. If somebody was editing this, it would say, "Yo, I do not eat churches chicken." And then like they'll cut to the part where it says, "When I go to the E complex, my choice is churches chicken." So you got to watch the editors. What happens is (laughs) because I spend so much time there when I'm there, the only thing, you've been there, the only thing is a dang on church's chicken and I go and get a biscuit. Do you eat church's chicken? Just for clarity. I eat biscuits from the establishment called churches. (laughs) I do not eat chicken from church's chicken. All right? So, environment. Have you stay focused on? We're, we're never going to sponsor this episode. We're, we're professional. We're never going to sponsor the podcast. We don't want Church's Chicken to you sponsor. Do. No, we don't. They're going to give you unlimited. Chicken. No. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing for me was having access to quality food. Like my daughter had such picky eating habits at that time, and I realized that being a younger mom, um, you know, and growing up, the quick, easy thing to do was to stop at McDonald's and get her the chicken nuggets just to hush her up. Well, there were no other options. I could drive up to the McDonald's. I didn't have to get out of the car. Otherwise, I got to get out the car, go to Publix, pick through the salad that's halfway ran down. You know, so I wanted some better choices in terms of food. And then I also needed to see people around me who were successful. I couldn't keep seeing people standing on the corners selling their bodies. I couldn't keep seeing the neighborhood dope boys. Like, I just can't. I know how it makes me feel. And it didn't make me feel like I wanted to be that person. It made me feel horrible for that person. And how dare I have these big dreams when there are people who are living like this. So I just needed to get in an environment where I saw success every single day. Mm. I saw it. Then what's your plan for it? So you've got your vision and you understand what it is. You, You know what your life should look like. You may not know how you're going to get it. It's not important. Somebody write down, it's about who, not how. Who, not how. And that's a book. I would yeah, actually get actually, that book. Morning meet up. We're, uh, we're reading that. Right? Who, not we're how. We're about to read it, yeah. Who, not how. It's really important. When you read this book, you're going to have a shift in perspective because we stay stuck on the how so long. Well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get the money? How am I going to get the building? How am I going to start the website? I have no tech experience. How, 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 how? When really, why are you worried about how when there are a bunch of who's out there who are proficient in building the website? Who's out there who can introduce you to the building that will give you uh, access with the Second Chance program? Who's out there who are understanding about how to access other people's money? Like, we stay so focused and centered on the how you have to choose success for yourself and the reason we stay so stuck one of the reasons we stay so stuck is because we haven't really chosen success we want to be successful just like you want to be married but you haven't chosen a spouse you got to choose the success and start showing up for that Paint the picture of the person, the man or the woman that you choose to be. What do you drive? What kind of clothes are you wearing? What kind of stores do you shop in? What does your hair look like? What do your children wear? What kind of clothes do they wear? But all you need really is 12 months. And I hate to say all you need because it's so insensitive, Mm -hmm. right? To people who are like, all I need is this month, let alone 12. But seriously, all you need is 12 months. Where can we get 12 months worth of this, of, of living expenses? Okay, am I, so... See, I'm in a different, I'm in a different position. No, well, my mm. so I have living expenses and then I have expenses. So, like that, like the payroll. Well, yeah, is a whole. It's a whole different deal. So you have to fact when I'm thinking about me and how to survive, I'm thinking about my business are my living expenses, like yeah. all of that, like 
my my rent, my mom's mortgage, my daughter's stuff, my business. I have to think about all of that. And then mm. now as an employer, you're in a situation because we're both employers at this point. We're in situations where we got people who are depending on us yeah. throughout For a sure. recession. <laughs> and well, Joe, look me in my eyes when you say that. You got to make some decisions. <laughs> like, so as an employer, as an entrepreneur who's also an employer, you also have to make some decisions. And now is the time to start thinking about it and having these conversations because one, you don't want to be in a position where your team is afraid because they don't know what to think and then they're leaving and you don't have the infrastructure now that you need to continue to build your business. Don't worry, guys. I got y'all for the next year and a half. But at the same time, you still have to run a business and provide for yourself. So do you now have to start looking at and saying, can I cut back? Like there are companies who will go and say, hey, we got to do some cutbacks financially. Like we, we, would you guys rather we do layoffs and some of you are safe at your current salary? Or would you rather share the burden of the recession and we cut back on what each person is paid. I would 100% love to just be talent right now, yeah. but I can't find anybody that like can take me and, and be like, come up with something, just an amazing idea and be able to execute. Mm -hmm. So you're also operating as your own visionary. Yeah, right now, mm -hmm. right now. But I don't want to. I'd mm -hmm. rather lean into one. I'd rather focus on being dope. Yeah, but you are a born visionary. And people who are born visionaries never stop leaning into their imagination of things that can happen. True. You're always going to think about ideas. I'm always going to think about ideas. And, and you just so happen to be the talent. And the key to that is to find the executors. Mm -hmm. Find those people who can take your vision now and allow you to be the talent in it. Because you only have to communicate the vision one time For sure. to the right team. And then you sit and be the talent. And then everybody else are in the details of making it happen. But the struggle comes in trying to be all of those things and not really understanding which role you are. We did an episode a while back about um, number twos, being super strong number twos, and this kind of leans into that, right? So many people want to be the talent when realistically, you're just not the talent. And a good example of that are songwriters in the mm. music industry who can sing. Yep. You can sing, you're behind off, but there's something about you that's not putting you in and, and you're chasing the dream of being a singer. Mm -hmm. You believe that your talent is being the singer, but the record producers and the artists believe that your talent is actually just in writing the songs. Mm -hmm. Like we get it, you're pretty, but you're missing personality or you got personality, but you're missing the look that we're looking for or whatever it is. So miscalculating what the talent actually is and trying so hard, so hard. And you, you hear about these stories all the time, man. I was trying to be an artist and I was in the studio dem demoing songs and then such and such artist walked in and was like, yo, let me get that. And then you end up being a songwriter and you thrive. Mm -hmm. But all the time you spent trying to be the main attraction, the singer, the artist. Yeah, You're really good at that. And I think that is one thing that is rubbed off on me from you is your ability to communicate the vision. Because before, quite honestly, I struggled with choosing the right employee or retaining the right employee. And it was because I was so connected to my vision. I initially led from a place of this is my vision. It's in my head. There was probably some kind of a fear attached to communicating what that vision was to the rest of the team. And it was more like, I pay you to do a job. But then the moment that I shifted and started to share the vision, I started to attract people that wanted to come and work for me, whether I could pay them or not. Like my very first assistant, they wanted to come and work for me, whether I could pay or not, right? And so that's something, too, if you're in a place as an entrepreneur or as a, as a CEO and you're struggling with team, you're struggling with people staying, you're struggling with people liking you and, they're in, in, in not being about money because we hear it all the time. Oh, they're just here for the money. Well, have you communicated the vision? Are you clear on what the vision is? And have you, your team and the people around you 
whether they understand it or not, they need to hear the vision from you. Yep. And there needs to be progress. Because once you say it, we got to see it. Once you say it, we got to see it. Meaning you got to keep working. So I'm talking about like, yo, this be the number one entrepreneurship podcast in the world. I'm not just saying it. I'm going to give you updates on how close we are. So right now, currently, according to the charts, not just my belief, we are the number one black entrepreneurship podcast in the country. So I'm, I'm looking at the charts. I'm, I'm, I'm not rocks with you, but she gave, a, she gave a couple standing ovations today. That's what's up. <laughs> but I'm looking at the charts. I'm looking at the charts. And I'm doing the work when all these lights and all that kind of stuff ain't set up. I'm, I'm looking at the charts. I'm listening to other podcasts. I'm looking at all the number ones in all the different categories because there's a million different categories. So I'm like, we hit like number seven and I'm, I'm scrolling up and I'm looking. I'm like, yo, everybody white. We good. That's the next. That's the next step. Like we got to be a number one in something. Then we got to go back and report it. We have progress. I'm gonna keep showing you the numbers, and that holds me accountable because I can't just stop showing you the numbers. Which means we got to keep growing. But some of you are so afraid to tell somebody because you're afraid to commit. I'm going all the way with this thing. You go all in. Like you got to hold yourself accountable. It's not enough to say. I want to achieve this goal and I'm going to do it consistently. I want to lose 30 pounds and I'm going to be consistent at going to the gym. But here's the thing about, here is the thing about self-accountability. So I'm going to change, we're on number four. four. I'm going to change number four to having someone else hold you accountable, not self-accountability because we let ourselves down every single day. And we're totally fine with it because nobody else typically knows. Mm -hmm. It's like when you're saying I'm on this weight loss journey and because I'm on this weight loss journey this week and this week alone, I'm on fruits and vegetables all week. But then you walk in the grocery store and you see that chocolate piece of cake and you buy it and you bring it home and you eat it. Nobody else knows. You may even still lose the weight that you wanted to lose this week. And somebody's going to say, wow, you look good Mm -hmm. this week. Nobody knows that you might have looked better. You might you might have achieved a bigger result. We let ourselves down so often that it doesn't even feel bad most times. You need someone else to hold you accountable. So I would say when you're on your journey of trying to become, figure out how to become consistent, because you got to get tired of like start the start and stop. The start and stop just really becomes disgusting at some point. You have to figure out, you have to find someone else that can hold you accountable But it has to be somebody who, when you mess up, you fear their disappointment. Mm. You don't want to deal, you don't want to face their disappointment, right? Mm. Like, we do social proof podcasts. If I called Shans and said, this is likely the most consistent I've been at a thing, (laughs) right? At a thing that requires my time, right? Right. Not building my business, I'm external to my business. This is likely the most consistent I've been. If I call David and said, oh, I can't record this week. I don't want to see his face when I say, I can't record this month. You just go ahead and drop some episodes without me. I'll come back next month. <laughs> I respect him enough to say, I'm not going to let him down in that way, mm-hmm. right? I could let myself down. And I'm thinking about, People I know who have podcasts that hadn't dropped an episode in three weeks, three months. And then you plug into the, you you hit them up and say, hey, you still doing your podcast? Oh yeah, I'm just taking a break right now. Who in here has just taken a break from something that you really should have been doing? Oh yeah, I'm just on, I'm just on a break right now. Nobody is holding you accountable. There is no consequence for it. So accountability and consequences Probably go hand in hand. I left North Carolina A&T and I came and uh, started taking a class at Clark. I remember uh, there's a, I think it was a, uh, what was Wells Fargo at first? It was Wachovia Bank. There was a Wachovia Bank and there was this homeless guy between on my way to the bank and I was going to deposit my check. 
And so this homeless guy is like, hey, you know, do you have any money? And I'm like, I don't have any money. But if you walk right there, I'm, you know, I'm right there. I'm about to turn in. I'm like, if you walk right there, you can meet me at the bank. I'll get some money for you. And so we go into the bank together, David, and we're standing in a line. He's standing in a line with me. And your boy takes out money, money, right? He takes money out of his pocket, like a big wad of money. And I go to the window and I'm like, I'm going to be right there with the $20. And he's like, okay, I'm going to go over here. He goes to the window to make a deposit. (laughs) He goes to the window to make a deposit. And I'm like, yo. Sonia's face is killing me right now. (laughs) So I leave my window and I go to his window and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I assumed you were homeless <laughs> because you asked me for some money. And here I am in college, but I just got my check. I'm about to give you $20. That's a big deal for me at that time, right? And he's like, I am homeless, but I have a bank account. That was my first time ever hearing that homeless people had a bank account, right? So I'm completely blown away. Where's the statement go? <laughs> right? I don't know. Because <laughs> it wasn't realize- like online banking at that right. time. I don't know. So I I walk out of the bank with him and I'm clutching on to my money. And I go outside and I say, if you can have a bank account, surely you can have a job. He showed me his receipt that had his balance on it. He had over $70,000 in the bank. $70,000 for the bank. He said, ma'am, I do have a job. I have a good job. Like, and show me this. His job was to be homeless and ask for money. And I asked him, who would choose this? Who would choose this? And he said, I don't belong in neighborhoods with the fancy little stuff and fancy little people. And, you know, you got 70 grand in the bank and you right here off the expressway. Yeah. And I'm like, sorry, I can't give you $20. Like, <laughs> you better off than me. But to, to your point, people will choose it. And there used to be a reality show that will go and find homeless people who have turned this into a hustle, who actually were, there were six figure income. You know what I'm talking about? There were six figure income earners of people who were homeless and they would rather keep all their money and stay under bridges because at some point or another in their life, they truly were homeless and didn't have money, but they found comfort in that space. And they found an environment of people who they were doing better than. Credit card debt, because what's going to happen is you're going to want to leverage your credit during the recession, right? Um, Mm, That's good. You're going to want to leverage your credit during the recession, hold on to some of your cash as much as possible. And then what's going to end up happening is, depending on how long we're in it, you may start paying these minimum balances. And then when we're on the other side of the recession, you have leveraged your credit and maxed it out or you're late having payments. So now you're coming out of the recession, building financially, but you also now are crippled from a credit perspective and your options will be significantly limited. So let's get those credit cards. I would say do that like first. That's a play. Get that those credit cards paid down right now so you can leverage them if you have when you have to, because you will have to. But we don't want to get through this recession period and then you come out with jacked up credit on the other side too. Some some of you, some entrepreneurs are struggling because you're staying in an idea too long. Mm. You may come up with these incredible ideas and you find a David and a Donnie who wants to buy it, but I don't want you in it. But they stay attached. (laughs) Like, I might not necessarily see your value in it. You have an amazing idea. Maybe you were a visionary, but that's kind of the end of your road. You have to also ask yourself, do I have a marketable idea that I just need to sell? And maybe you're such a great visionary that Your vision allows you to come up with all of these ideas that you just sell off to whoever wants to buy it. And that's your way to your creating your legacy and your financial freedom. But there's so many people who just want to stay attached to that idea because it's their idea. Yeah. And you make no money. (laughs) (laughs) So what about what you do? Can you automate? Right. What can you delegate and what can you automate? So maybe you do high ticket sales. And your business requires sales calls. And you're doing the sales calls. Can you now hire a sales team? 
systems, people think that systems are all technology and systems are not technology. Systems are simply a way that something is done over and over and over and over again. So identify what are the repetitive tasks that are happening in your business? What happens every single day on a frequency? And then ask yourself, how can I simplify this process? Is it people? Is it a software? Is it a process? How can I simplify it? So I know commonly many entrepreneurs want to engage their clients via email and text messages. Well, make your life easier and put a system in place for that and pre-schedule emails. If you're sending out revenue generating emails, let's go ahead and pre-schedule those. How can you pre-plan your content? That's a process that's a part of a system, right? Instead of taking notes on paper, what kind of client management software can you use now to digitally track your clients and their progress? SOPs. What kind of processes and workflows can you put together so that you can train everybody? So SOPs are really great for, for two really good reasons, you right? You want to share what SOPs are? I'm sorry. Standard operating procedures. The way you do something in your business or the way you get to the result. So you want SOPs for two primary reasons. Number one, you want them to make sure that the people who are working in your business are all operating by the same code of business. And number two, you want SOPs in place to make sure that your clients and customers are served the same way. You don't want somebody to get Jacob on a sales call and they get a 10 minute call and, you know, it was in Jacob's voice. And then somebody else gets Stephanie on a call and it's a 45 minute call and they got the whole shebang red carpet laid out for them. The SOPs is a part of a process, which is a part of a system that makes sure that your employees are all marching to the beat of the same drum and your customers and clients are all getting the same experience. So right now, right now, what are three things that you can begin working on automating and delegating right away in your business? And start with the thing that you're doing that you're not so great at doing and it makes you money. And what are you doing that is a, that, that you need to make money and you're not so great at doing it, but you've been trying to DIY yourself there forever? Let's put a system in place for it. So, for example, me. Tech. I'm capable of doing tech. I was an engineering major. I decided a very long time ago that I don't want to be bothered with tech. I don't like to sit at the computer and just be deep in the details and figuring stuff out. I'm going to pay somebody to do that, right? But for so long before I could pay somebody to do that, I was trying to figure out how to set up these workflows. And then it's a disaster and all this good stuff. And then I took a course that taught me how to put a system in place. I got coaching from someone that taught me how to put certain systems in place. Tech was important. It was the first thing that I delegated and automated because without my sales funnels and without my landing pages, I don't have a way to communicate my message. I don't have a way for people to go and do business with me, right? So that's, that's something. Maybe you're taking payments via Cash App. Oh, just Cash App me, PayPal me. No. Let's put a system in place. How can you collect money like a professional? But not only are you collecting money, you're collecting data. Because when you're using like a Stripe or however you're getting paid, Square, whatever it is, they're collecting your customer data. They're collecting names, emails, phone numbers, locations. You're getting so much more data. It's a growth task. It's a responsibility that you have to make sure that you're, you have a good system in place for accepting payment. Team meetings, that's a system. Your team isn't operating to your beat. They don't know what's going on. You're constantly texting everybody individually. No, routine and regular team meetings. That is a system. 
that you have in your in place in your business. We're entertained by the foolishness and we're not clear with what we actually want. Have you asked for it for what it is that you actually want? Like, have you literally said, I want the six figure business or I want the seven figure business doing X, Y and Z? So many people are still at work saying they don't want a job, but they're looking for and prepare for their promotion. That went over your head. Mm. See, I was never the two percent raise at my job when I work didn't bother me. I'm not going to be here long enough to get it. <laughs> Quiet the hell. Quiet. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to the one year review. I am only here to work to learn how you guys run your business so I can go and implement these and these lessons into my own business. You were how am I going to be worried about a 2% raise and being an entrepreneur? Entrepreneur is someone who is self-employed. Mm-hmm. You're working for yourself, building your own thing. So now ask yourself, are you wanting things that are contradictory to themselves? Which is create the time. So I remember early on, mm. and we have had a few moments where we might record. We need we need a few days, ideally a week. To record an episode, produce the episode, clip the episode up, get the thumbnail ready, you know, whatever that is, and release the episode. But there are some times where our schedules just don't align and we may be recording an episode today that drops tomorrow. That throws everybody's schedule off track, right? And in the beginning, we had a lot of that going on. Hey, can you record today? Hey, can you? No, I can't today. How about tomorrow? No, I can't today. How about? And then we're meeting the day of to record an episode and end up dropping it late at night. And then Dave starts to pay attention to the analytics and that ain't working. And that's not the way. Scheduling the time. When we said every single Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, this is there's no question. I don't have to figure out how I'm going to make time for this. I don't have to create space that I'm not already accustomed to. It's on our calendar. It's every single week. We don't have to question it. We know where, if I don't talk to David all week, I know that I have to be here at 10 o'clock every single Wednesday morning, right? So scheduling out the time. So what does that look like for you? Um, I do this calendar training. We're going to keep it really short and simple, but Most times people aren't consistent because they feel like they don't have the time to be consistent at a thing. I want you to open up your calendar, whether it's digital or um, a paper calendar. I personally like a paper calendar for this particular thing. And I want you to write out, start with all of your standing appointments that you have right now. Write out everything that's standing. So if you get your hair done every Thursday at 12, put that down. If you have kids and they have practices you know, games, write that on the calendar because those are standing things that you that are non-negotiable, right? And then if you're working a job, I want you to write down those hours. So if you write, if you work a nine to five on your calendar, write nine to five, build somebody else's dream. Remember this train? <laughs> I want you to write it on Monday. And then on Tuesday, I want you to write from nine to five, build somebody else's dream. Wednesday, again, nine to five, build somebody else's dream. Nine to five, build somebody else's dream. On Thursday, it's nine to five, build somebody else's dream. I use my lunch break to get my hair done. You'll look at this calendar and you'll notice the things that you are consistently doing. You are consistently going and making somebody else's dream come true. And you mean to tell me that you can't find a 30 minute window every day a one hour window every day to make your own dream come true or to accomplish your own goal. When you see it, which is why I like to write it, write the vision, make it plain. When you write this out, you're going to look at yourself and you'll be baffled at the result. If you like the video that you just watched, click this one. You're going to like this one, maybe even more. Click it right now.